Morning, church. Good to see you and excited to jump into God's Word together with you. If you have your Bibles, why don't you turn to Matthew chapter 22 this morning. Matthew chapter 22, but I need to forewarn you that today's message is going to be a little bit different than our normal tradition here at Mission Church in the sense that while we're starting in Matthew 22, we're going to be going to a number of different places. Our normal pattern is to just dig into one text and one paragraph or chapter of Scripture and really unpack that, and we are going to do some unpacking here this morning, but we're going to be moving a couple different spots, so you are now duly forewarned. Well, this morning we, st- we continue our series called The Essentials of the Way, The Essentials of the Way, and we've been talking about how Jesus has a way. And as you think about this, think, think about the title, The Essentials of the Way. If Jesus has a way, we're looking at the essential parts of the way, the foundational, central, kind of most important parts of God's way uh, uh, that he wants to teach to us. And so we, when I think about way, I oftentimes think about the fact that way requires some sort of travel. And um, I was remembering that I was uh, in seminary one time, and I had this incredibly difficult moment figuring out the way. You see, I lived in the suburbs of Chicago, and I had to travel downtown to the campus that was right at the heart of the city, Uh, and uh, as I I would take class, uh, I I would have to come home oftentimes during rush hour. Now, if you know anything about men, you'll know this. We don't take instruction very well when it comes to driving places. Is that true? Do I get an amen? So I thought there would be an amen already from there, from the wives at least, right, uh, who would say, yeah, my guy, he doesn't really do that super well. And, uh, and I'm one of those. I was raised by my father, raised by his father, raised by his father. We, we don't ask for instructions. We just know the way. We just know our way. It goes well. We just do our way, our thing. And so as I left one time from, uh, from school, uh, I remember hearing that um, there were these newfangled contraptions called Garmin GPS. That might tell you how long ago it was, if my beard color doesn't. And, uh, and in that, we see that I, I heard that somebody with one of these new things said that there was a real mess on the highway. And I thought, well, it doesn't matter. Got jumped in my car, started driving down the Eisenhower Expressway. And, and I did hear on the radio somebody say that there was this horrendous event that had occurred down the road and that everybody should avoid it, if at all possible, detour. They gave you instructions about how to go a different way. And, and you know what I did, right? I just kept going. I can get through this. I've done this a million times. I've done it this way. It's generally worked out. I've sat in traffic before, but it wasn't so bad until frustrated and flailing in my car seat two and a half hours later, I still wasn't home. You see, somebody told me that I should do something different than the way that I was, but my stubborn heart, my stubborn heart was like, nope, I'm just going to do it my way. I've done it this way before. It works out. And even though there's warnings about it, I'm just going to keep doing it my way way. And I think many times in life, we take that kind of attitude towards how we live our lives. We're, we're told we're, there's a warning, there's, there's something going on, there's, there's, there's a way maybe you need to do some things differently, but we just keep doing things the way we've always done them. Anybody ever felt like they were maybe stuck in the jam of life, flailing, frustrated, kind of upset that the way that things are going aren't really going super well at the moment, knowing that you've been maybe told that there's some different ways, some detours, some different things that you should do, but having not listened to those things, you're just kind of stuck. The way has gotten blurry. You're not quite sure what you should do next. Well, the good news is that we have good news. (laughs) We have the way given to us, hold your Bible up this morning. What did you bring? Hold your Bible up. And we find in here the way of Jesus. And that's what we're looking at here today. Pastor Jerry last week kicked off our series and helped us to see that there is a way. And he taught us from Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, that Jesus has said that we are to go wherever we're going and make disciples of all nations and baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then we really focused on that last line that said, and he, 
and teach them to observe all that I have commanded them. This is the command of Jesus to the 11 disciples, probably even a somewhat larger group, but for sure these 11 disciples who had walked with him and been training with him were told that they were to teach all that Jesus commanded to the disciples that they were making. So the question I have when I hear something like that in Scripture is, did they do it? Did those 11 men entrusted with all that Jesus commanded, did they actually teach that? And the resounding answer is yes. But sometimes I have a little bit of a trouble with with the fact that I know that they heard this command and they certainly must have obeyed the command. So where is the teaching that Jesus commanded that they tell all of us who are disciples? Where is that how-to manual, if you will? Uh, if, if there's all these commands, shouldn't they be kind of in a list and, and, and we see command one and two and three and we, we just kind of see what that list is and that there's some spot where that is recorded? And then we go, wait, well, I've, I've read my Bible and I, I, I don't really see that manual aspect of it. So where is this teaching? And the answer is this, the teaching is found in the New Testament epistles, These men who heard Jesus say, teach them all I've commanded you, who walked with him for three years and heard all of his commands, did in fact actually record them. They're just not in manual format, which I'm super grateful for because have you ever tried to put together an Ikea desk before? Right? That that manual thing doesn't even really make sense to me in any ways. And so maybe it's better that it's not in that format and that we instead get real letters written to real churches addressing real people who are actually teaching all that Christ commanded. Now, the difficulty is we read these letters and we recognize they're in letter format, they're not in manual format, and so sometimes we get confused as to what is all the teaching of Christ because of the form that it comes into. But, but if we were to take time to study these epistles and see if there's any sort of pattern and any way that they teach kind of the same themes and topics and and begin to put those things together, could we have, could we have the essentials of the way? And the answer is yes. We have the essentials of the way because of the pattern of Scripture captured in the epistles that tell us how to see Jesus' way and then show that way to others as well. And so last week we learned that there's a way and we kind of put that pattern together into four different categories. These are the essential things. Uh, we, We talked about the heart, that God wants your heart first of all. And then we said that he placed you in a family. And then he called you into his church. And then he sends you out for world impact. And those categories begin to, see, begin, begin to show the pattern in the epistles that help us categorize Jesus' teaching, be able to see what that is, and then actually do all that he's commanded us to do. And so in this year, this year that we have, our theme is growing stronger in 2023, it seemed good to the elders and pastoral staff that we would focus, first of all, on what are the essentials of the way. And so that's what this teaching, this preaching series is. But not only is there a preaching series, we're in the midst of writing some studies that are going to eventually be used within our church to help people in the basics of understanding these very, th- very same things. But can I also say, not just for somebody who's never heard it before, but also for all of you who maybe have heard some of these things and been studying because everybody needs a spiritual checkup. Remember Pastor Jerry last week talking about the eye checkup that he had that suddenly revealed he needed those glasses And wow, were those some ugly old man glasses on a seven-year-old. Can I just commend you for choosing those? And and yet in that, we we all recognize there's a time where we need our eyes checked. and, And really, if you would utilize this series as a spot to check your spiritual eyes, the eyes of your heart, that would fulfill the purpose of what I believe God has laid on our hearts in these things. And so today we begin by looking at the first essential. We're going to look at the essentials of the heart, the essentials of the heart. And if you don't remember anything else from this message, remember this phrase right here. Ready for it? God wants your heart. If you're a note taker, type those into your little app notes, write those down into the piece of paper you got on the way in. God wants my heart. 
God wants my heart, so I'm called to give it to him. Jesus taught this to us. He actually commanded this of us. And, and then he didn't leave us hanging with just the command, but he gave the apostles all the teaching that is necessary for you to actually do this, for you to actually give Jesus the totality of who you are, that is your heart. And so we're going to look today and see, do a little spiritual checkup and see the way of Jesus, we're going to see, first of all, that God wants my heart. That's the first point, again, if you're writing things down this morning. God wants my heart. How do we know that God wants my heart? Because he's told us it very clearly, very simply. Jesus said these words in Matthew chapter 22. Look at verse 27. It simply says that, I'm sorry, 37. It simply says this, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and with all your mind. It's just that simple. Jesus commanded that you should love the Lord your God with all of your heart and all of your soul and all of your mind. Jesus' command here, the way of Jesus, the thing that Jesus wants you to see is that the way of living his way is first and foremost that you love him with all of your heart. You love him with all you've got. Now, Jesus said this in verse 37, but just a little bit of understanding of how Jesus got to the spot of speaking this in this particular instance, instance we see back in verse 34 that the Pharisees heard that, the, he, that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees and they got all together. Jesus is actually in the last week before his death and burial and ultimately his resurrection. He's in the temple courts and he's having these, these conflicts with religious leaders who didn't believe that he was the Messiah. They didn't believe the truth of what he was preaching. And so he told some parables about those who reject the Messiah. And then they, in return returned fire, and they started asking him some questions about paying taxes, about the resurrection, which is where he kind of overcame the Sadducees, and in the, this last instance about the, the, from the Pharisees about the law. Notice verse 35, one of, the, one of them, a lawyer, a teacher of the law, an expert of the law, asked him the question to test him, not because he actually wanted to know Jesus. He's trying to trip Jesus up in some way, and he says, Teacher, teacher, interestingly, teacher because he wouldn't call him a rabbi because he doesn't think he's authoritative. He's testing him. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Now, that was a kind of a debate that regularly happened among the religious people of the day. What is the greatest of the commandments that we find in what we call the Old Testament? The over 600 laws that are proclaimed there, what was the, actually what they would often say is, what is the heaviest, meaning greatest, most important, what is the heaviest? And they would have all sorts of, listen, when the religious leaders got together and had a party, they didn't have a cake, they didn't have birthday kazoos and all that, they didn't do fun stuff, no dancing, none of that stuff, they just had a big debate, okay? And in that, they would always debate these things, and, and, Jesus, and this, the expert of the law is asking Jesus to weigh in on these things, and Jesus immediately responds with, you should love the Lord your God with all your heart. No question, no waffling, no wondering what is the weightiest and heaviest thing. The first and foremost, it's that you would love the Lord your God with everything that you've got. Now notice in this phrase here in verse 37, now, there's a couple of things I think we need to unpack. First of all, when Jesus says love, what does he mean? Because in our culture, in our world, oftentimes when we hear the word love, we think of like Hallmark Christmas movie. We think of romance. When, when in our common culture, oftentimes love is thought of as the, that deep emotional feeling. Listen, love is incredibly powerful and it's incredibly important. I'm no down on love in these things, but we, when we think about love, we often think of it just in some sort of romantic or type of way in those things, but that's not actually what love means here. A, a, a word study to un help us understand this would show us this, that, that when Jesus says love, he's referring to an act of the mind and the will. It's the idea of determined care for something or something else. 
So, so contrary to what we often think of when we talk about love, we often think about romance and we think about ourselves. Je- when Jesus used the word, he's talking about an act of the will and the mind for someone or somebody else. Simple de- biblical definition of love is simply you before me. That, that's oftentimes what it is. We twist it and we think that we're first, but here it's actually this idea of somebody else. It might include strong emotions. It should include strong emotions. But the distinctive characteristic of of it is a dedication and a commitment of choice. It's a love that chooses to follow what is righteous and noble and true regardless of one's feelings in the matter. It's kind of like the mom who loves well in the grocery store when their three-year-old is throwing the temper tantrum for not getting the candy that they wanted, right? And a mom who loves well at that moment is acting selflessly and for the individual, even though all of the, she sees all of the eyes on her and all the embarrassment of all those things and my, get my kid in line and I just want to force him to do something, right? And a mom in that moment who can tenderly and patiently listen This is an incredible description of love (laughs) because it's so hard. I've been that that parent in the grocery store with the kid flailing on the floor and just so embarrassed about those things, and I'm very, very selfish in that moment. But Jesus is saying, no, love, love love is when you actually care more about the other person than yourself at this moment. And and so there's this incredibly high standard of love being talked about here. He says, love in that way, love with all of your heart. Let's talk about heart for a moment. Jesus, when he says this, makes a statement that would seem to indicate that you're supposed to love God with three different things, your heart and your soul and your mind. Do you see it in the verse? Love the Lord with all your heart and then with all your soul and then with all your mind. And, and, and so we look at this and we read this and we begin to think about that there's, that Jesus is talking about some technical, uh, separate categories and definitions of human nature that we're supposed to compartmentalize and love God in these couple of different ways in, the, in that, but Jesus isn't actually doing that. When he says, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind, he's actually saying, love him with everything that you are, all that you've got. He's talking about the category of heart that describes the totality of who you are. So I have a pretty good friendship with Pastor Jerry, and, and, and if I were to say to him, I'm, I'm getting to know Pastor Jerry, you wouldn't think, well, Pastor Nate's just getting to know Pastor Jerry's nose. Pastor Nate's just really interested now in Pastor Jerry's ears. That's weird, correct? <laughs> If I were to tell you I'm getting to know Pastor Jerry better, you would know that I'm talking about the totality of his personhood, right? And, and that's what Jesus is trying to show here. Listen, yes, there's these kind of different aspects, but they all merge together. They're not separate categories. It's the totality of who you are. It's all of your being. The Bible actually talks about the category of heart over a thousand different times, and most of the time that it's speaking about something, it's talking about the totality of personhood, not some thing be, organ beating in your chest or some category of your person, but all of who you are. The heart is really the seat of who you are, all that you're made up to, being, to be. And yes, these, this heart, uh, your emotions, the soul, your will, the mind, your thoughts are aspects of that, but it's the totality of, of source that God is talking about. He, he's calling you to love him with every aspect, every molecule of who you are. Love him in that total type of way. An old Puritan preacher talked about, talking about what is the source and the beginning of our personhood and who we are said it this way. He says, what the heart loves, the will chooses, and the mind justifies. And then I would say the body does and we let our emotions feel good about that the heart is the source of all of those things. It's the source of the will. It's the source of our, well, our, of our mind thoughts and our actions and our feelings and all of these things. And Jesus says we are to love the Lord our God with every part of who we are. He wants all of you. John MacArthur said it this way, God has never sought either empty words or empty ritual. His desire is for the person himself, not simply what the person possesses. 
If he truly has the person, he, is inevitably, he inevitably has all that the person possesses as well. And just as God loves with his whole being, we are to return his love with our whole being. I really love that quote and particularly the end of it that talks about God loving us. He, God, God, he's saying here God doesn't love us with just little aspects and parts of him. God loves us with all of who he is. And so then when Jesus says, then love God in return with all of who you are, there's no hypocrisy in that statement. It's the demonstration of the greatest form of love that's supposed to happen. God loves you with all of who he is, and so he's calling you to love him with all that you are. The question then is, how do we measure that? How do we know if we're loving God with the, with the totality, the comprehensiveness of who we are in this way? And fascinating, you should ask. I know you didn't ask, okay? But fascinating, you should ask. Because Jesus, listen, the lawyer didn't ask either, and Jesus just went ahead and plowed ahead and said, look at verse 30, 35, I'm sorry, 38. This is the, first, the great and first commandment, 39. And the second is like it. You shall love the Lord, your, uh, you should love your neighbor, excuse me, as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Jesus is saying there's a super easy way to measure if you're loving comprehensively, if you're comprehensively loving God. And it's simply, here, quick, look at the person next to you. It's if you're loving them. And if you're loving them the way that you love yourself. Notice, love your neighbor as yourself. Interesting that Jesus should should put that in there because he's describing a, 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 the way that we're made to love. You and I have no problem loving ourself. Now, that being said, there's, there's ways that that gets twisted around and we think we might not like ourselves. There's certainly moments where I have thought I don't really like who I am. Those things happen. But at the same time, there is within us th- this very natural ability that when I'm hungry, I go feed myself. <laughs> And when I'm thirsty, I go drink something. And when I'm sick, I get myself to the doctor. Why? Because I know how to care for myself. And God is saying, listen, this love, this comprehensive love for God that you can measure in how you love others, do you love others like yourself? Like that is the totality of the description of the kind of love that we're supposed to have for our Lord and demonstrate to our neighbor as well. God is saying here, he wants your heart. Say it with me. God wants my heart. Go ahead. God. Wow. Do you understand what you just said? God wants my heart. In this message, I'm trying to challenge you to see that so that you give it to him. And that you give not just a piece of your heart, that you don't live a compartmentalized where on Sunday morning I give God my heart, but the rest of the week I don't. But that you give your heart to Him in totality. And even as I show this way of Jesus to you, this command to love God with all your heart, is anybody going like, wait a second, Pastor Nate, that sure seems a little impossible. Love God with all my hearts like I know my heart. <laughs> and you might begin to feel the tension of this. It's probably a tension that you felt from the very beginning that you were taught about God. As you were taught about God, one of the first themes, listen, if you were a child and you were in our kids' ministry, you're going to hear that you're supposed to love God from the very beginning, right? If if you came to church as an adult, somebody has probably told you very quickly in the process that there is an expectation that you're going to love God with all of your heart. It it is, after all, called the great commandment, and it is the thing that Jesus says, summarizes everything else in the Bible, if you love God with all your heart, soul, and mind. 
And yet the tension must exist. It exists within all of us that we know that God loves us in totality and completely and that we are to return that love. But I know that I have difficulty. It seems impossible to actually do that wholeheartedly. I mean, how many of you can right now today say that you know that you've given God all of yourself? We begin to see that, wait a second, (laughs) Jesus, you're commanding something of us that, that in and of myself, in my strength, in my being, with no, no outside help, I'm going to fall short of. I'm going to fail in this. I'm not going to wholeheartedly be able to love God in this total and comprehensive way. I can't give him all I've got. I stumble in this on a regular basis. Well, that's okay. God has a long history of helping people in that particular status. From the very beginning, listen, this command to love God with all your heart, this is, this is a timeless truth. This is something from before time began, already existed in eternity, will continue to exist. This is a timeless truth. God has always pursued the hearts of those he has created. Jesus here says, Everything that God has revealed to you, all the law and the prophets, all of the things that he has revealed to you culminates in this command to to love him in this way. And and so Jesus, who, can I remind you, when he came, we're told he fulfills all the law and the prophets, okay? He he then comes back around and says that as I've even fulfilled all the law and the prophets, I'm telling you, you must still love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and and mind. And even though God has for many years told us that this is the command, we struggle to do it even as we have been commanded to do it. Do you know why? Because a command doesn't actually power you to actually do what it says. Romans 3 verse 20 is super clear about this. It says, for by the works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight since through the law comes knowledge of sin. Law doesn't actually empower you to do the command. It tells you the standard, but it basically then shows you you can't meet that standard, and it doesn't power you to meet it in any particular way. So when we see this command, it points to the reality that my heart is rotten and in, its, in, in and of itself, my heart does not choose to love God, and, and it's primor- primarily consumed with the goal of probably loving myself more than anything else. And because I have this issue, my heart is really an idol factory, constantly producing something else to worship other than God, something else to pursue and cling to, all the other ungodly desires and positions and postures of our hearts pursue those things. So what do we do? What do we do if Jesus has commanded us to love God with all of our heart? What do we do? Because we have an inability in and of ourself, and even the revelation of the command itself doesn't allow me to actually power up and do what it says, what do we do? Well, remember at the beginning I told you about my little traffic experience, and I was pretty convinced that there was a way to go about it even though I had been told that there was something different. And how I said, it, we often live life that way, and, and there's really kind of two ways that we respond to Jesus and his way and his command. Way number one, we respond to his command, and we just kind of say, you know what, that's great, that's for you, that's not for me. I'm actually God of my life. I'm in control of my life. It's my way of doing things. And so, listen, I know that you say, love the Lord your God with all your heart. I'm going to do it my way. I'm not going to follow God's way of doing that. I'm going to follow my way of doing that. And that's actually super prevalent in this world. It causes people who then come to the hard truth of what Jesus' way is to have to perform. Because you know you've not really done it his way. And so you have to, I'm sorry, you have to pretend. (laughs) Mixed up my words. You have to pretend. You have to pretend that you're following after God's way. You know it's your way, but, it's, but you pretend when you get around God's people and God's word, and you pretend like you're doing it his way, and that's not a way that actually works out. There's a second way that we often interact with these things. The second way is, uh, is one in which we say, we look at all the rules, and 
We like to keep the rules, and so we have a very clear set of rules in our mind, and, and we perform all sorts of religious ritual to keep the rules. And we think that we're good and that we're okay and we're following Jesus' way because we're, we're doing all the things that he tells us to, so because I did what he told me to, he now owes me something. And in that, we then are on this constant ham, hamster wheel to perform. We're always trying to perform the rules to his standards, to his ways, and the reality is we fall short in both of those things. If, if we say, you know what, we're just going to do it our way, we fall short. If we say, you know what, I see your rules and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it to the best of my effort, we still fall short in those things. And so I'm so grateful that Jesus has actually given us a third way of living. We don't have to be on the pretend or perform ways. We can be on the gospel way, the Jesus way. And so even as I've tried to help you see the way of Jesus, I've tried to help you see that Jesus' way is that, first of all, your heart, the totality of it, the priority of it is fully loving God. We have to deal with the fact that we fall short of those things and we try at least two other categories of ways to make up for it that don't actually work out. And Jesus has given us not only the command to see and to know, but then he's actually unpacked for us how we can actually do it his way. And so as we look at this today, we, we see that the way of Jesus is that he wants our heart, but we also begin to see, uh, uh, begin to know that God is the one who's actually going to empower our hearts to actually do what the command says. This is what you need to know so that you can show it to others as well. You have to show the way that God is the one who not only commands us to love him, but he empowers our heart to do that very thing. So as you know, we've been, we're doing this series to try to get us to understand these very essential parts of our walk, the, these essential things of the way of Jesus. And we said earlier, Jesus has a way, and, and he taught it to the apostles who then wrote it in the New Testament. And so what I want to now do is show you what is the way of Jesus to love God with our whole being that he just commanded of us. What, what do we, when we read the New Testament scripture, what are the patterns that begin to bubble to the surface that show us that there isn't, there, there's a very clear pathway, there's a very clear way to actually do what Jesus commanded? We need to know this so that we can show this to others as well. You need to know this so you can live this out, but also so that you can help show this to others as well. And it's quite possible that, that if you were asked the question, you're supposed to love God with all your heart, your whole being, the totality of who you are, that you may struggle to actually show somebody how the Bible teaches to actually do that. And so I want to unpack that for us here today, and I brought some signs to help us do this. Let me tell you the way. We're, we're just going to lay it right out here. Pretend like this is kind of a road map, and these are the signs that are going to come up and show us the way. The, the way that we actually do the command that Jesus said to love him with our whole being is, first of all, by having a heart of gospel power. We're going to look at Romans chapter 1 here in a second. Turn in your Bibles there right now. Romans chapter 1 verse 16 says that the gospel is the power of God to salvation. But, but while our heart is regenerated and made new by the power of the gospel, there, there then is another part of the pathway that begins to happen. Our heart then begins to be filled with inner virtue. God's going to place his virtue, his values, his way within your heart. When, when those virtues are then placed into your heart, we, you then have the opportunity to have a heart renewed by your mind, Romans 12 says that you're transformed by the renewing of your mind. And then, as our hearts are renewed, what do you think happens? Anybody want to guess? Your heart's renewed. There's some inner value virtues going on in there. Your mind begins to change and think differently. What happens next? You have a heart of outer change. It's going to make a difference on the outside, too. 
Now, normally what happens is we start with this. We just try to do behavior modification. We just try to make somebody do things the way that we think God told them to do it. But but the problem with that is if you don't have a heart of gospel power and inner virtue and a mind of renewal, this is fleeting. But when this happens, you begin to act within the relationship that God has intended to have with you from the very beginning. You have a heart of a daily walk because it's a relational thing. When God says he wants your heart, he's saying, I want to have a relationship with you. And so many times people's view of God is so distant and so, so, so much, so further than just the simple conversation and listening that takes place in a daily walk with the Lord. So what I want to do is I want to take us through this way of Jesus here and show you how the epistles tell us how to love the Lord our God with all of our hearts. And it starts first and foremost with the heart of gospel power. Look in your Bibles in Romans chapter 1. I told you to turn there earlier and look at verse 16. Paul is writing this epistle to the church in Rome and he says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes to everyone who believes. Notice here, the gospel power is being put on display and explained. Paul here is saying three things. There's a gospel, there's a a power that comes from it, and there's a result that, that comes from that gospel power. Let me just quickly explain these things. The gospel is actually good news. Literally, the world means good news. And it was oftentimes used when there was a victory in a military campaign. And the army would come home, and and they would come into the city, and there was good news. We won. There was gospel news. And and that's what this is. Paul's saying there's good news of victory for your heart. Do you know why you need good news of victory for your heart? Look at verse 18. It says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. Listen, if there's going to be good news, we have to say, what's the good news from? And the good news is from the fact that all of us, every single person, is born from the very beginning to only contribute ungodly unrighteousness in the relationship with God. We do not love God. In fact, we are his enemies, and we hate him. Listen, if you're here today, and somebody dragged you to church, and you don't really want to be here, that's where we all started. But the good news, the victory news, the victory news is... There's a power to change that about you. And it's not going to come from any of your thinking, your own thinking. It's not going to come from anything that you do in and of yourself. It's going to come from God making this gospel known to you. What is the power of the gospel? Well, it says it right there in the verse, in verse 17. Look at it. It says, for it, the gospel, it, it is the righteousness of God revealed from faith for faith, as it, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Here's what I want you to know. The, the power of the gospel is that it is the righteousness of God. Righteousness points to the fact that he's perfect in every single way. He's righteous. He's holy. He's perfect which for somebody who doesn't have the gospel is in fact terrifying because it says the wrath of God is reserved for those who are unrighteous. But the good news is that if you're unrighteous and you put your faith, it says in this verse, you put your faith, your trust in the gospel message, it moves you from a God of righteousness who then gives you his righteousness. That's what it says at the end of the verse. It says the gospel is the righteousness of God, therefore you become righteous who live by faith. What is it? 
What is this gospel message that supernaturally transforms my heart from one that is unrighteous and ungodly and deserving the wrath of God to one that is in fact righteous and joins the family of God? What is the gospel message is an essential and important thing to know. First, let me tell you the basic facts, the essential facts of the gospel, and then how, you should, or, or how God calls you to respond. Here at Mission Church, we have a statement called the Gospel and Discipleship Statement. As you join our membership class, we, we unve- unveil that for you and begin to unpack that for you. As you take our classes here at church, as you involve, get involved in our small groups, we begin to un- unpack and teach and show all of these things. But, but in all of it, we continue to say at least these five things these essential things about the gospel, we say first and foremost, the gospel message is that Jesus is the prophesied Messiah. He's the one that fulfills everything that was said about the rescuer who was coming from the very beginning when sin entered the world in Genesis 3.15, where it said that there was a rescuer who was going to come. Jesus fulfills every single prophecy that was ever said about that rescuer, that Messiah who is coming. Secondly, the second key and element, essential element of the gospel is that Jesus is the divine Son of God who came to earth as the sinless man. A lot goes into that phrase, but what we're saying here is that Jesus is fully God and fully man. That's his identity. And when you believe the totality of who he is as fully God and fully man who came to earth, that is an essential aspect of the gospel. Fact number three, and maybe the thing that's right at the heart of it, is this. Jesus died for our sins, was buried, and rose from the grave on the third day. What we're saying here is that Jesus is our substitute. We were the unrighteous that deserved the wrath of God, but he was the one that took all of our sin and became sin and died on the cross and shed his blood and took the wrath of God on him so that we could have Jesus' perfect righteousness. That's the substitutionary work of the gospel. That's the good news of the gospel. That, that, that's the message that begins to truly change all that we are. Fact number four, then, is this. Jesus ascended to heaven and now sits at the right hand of the Father as Lord of all, which means, which means, listen, while he died on the cross for your sin, he then rose and ascended, conquering death, conquering sin, conquering all of those things, so that now he sits in heaven reigning at the right hand of God, Hebrews 8 says. That's where he currently is, but that's not where he's always going to be because the fifth fact is this. Jesus will come again to judge the earth, establish his kingdom, and reign forever. Jesus is coming back. John 14, 3, tell, John 14 tells us, if I go, I'm coming back. I'm going to prepare a place for you. I'm coming back so that you can be there with me. This is the gospel message that change our heart, that changes our heart and causes us to move from the status of unrighteous and ungodly to one that is following after Jesus in his way. When we hear the facts of the gospel, then we're called to respond to the gospel by loving God with all of our heart. How? By repenting. Saying, God, I've been doing it wrong. I thought it was the right way, but it's resulted in this wreck. <laughs> of a life. And I'm recognizing my way doesn't work. That's what repenting, repentance is really saying. My way doesn't work. God's way, your way is perfect. It's best. It's the way I need to follow. I'm making a turn. I'm stopping to do things my way, and I'm starting to do things the way of Jesus. That's how we respond to the gospel message. And it results in salvation. That's what the verse says. Look again at verse 16. I'm not ashamed of the gospel, this good news, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. Notice, it's not the power to salvation for everyone. It's to everyone who believes. Which means you're going to have to surrender doing things your way, and start doing things his way. It's good news. It's victory news. It's a military word. It's a word that says Jesus has conquered, and if you surrender your life to him, you get to be part of the victory parade. If not, you get to be part of the wrath of God. That's hard to say. (laughs) 
So surrender your heart. Surrender your way. Raise the white flag. Jesus wants your heart. It's his way. And the way that you give it to him is first and foremost by surrendering, giving up all that you are. All your dreams, all your desires, all your possessions, all your things. Surrender your heart to him. It was what allows you to have a heart that is regenerated, made new, so that you will actually love the Lord your God with all your heart instead of just loving yourself or some idol that you have conjured. That's step number one. Step number two here, then, is that we have a heart with gospel power, heart of gospel power that we, I've said that it, it regenerates us, it makes us new, because then it fills our heart with inner virtue, inner virtue. Look at, uh, turn in your Bibles, if you will, to 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1 it makes this most clear that we're going to see a couple of other places, some important things. In 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 5, it says, for this reason, he said some things earlier, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue. <laughs> supplement your faith with virtue. And virtue with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with steadfastness, and steadfastness with... It starts to sound like a list that we hear in Galatians that is called the fruit of the Spirit, right? Not exactly the same, but somewhat similar in these things. These virtues are being called for. Uh, supplement your faith. When you put your faith in the gospel power, then supplement that with virtue. I got to thinking about supplement for a moment there. Well, that's kind of an interesting word in English, supplement. It means literally to fully supply or to furnish. I got to thinking of it in this particular way. Um, oftentimes, I, I saw my, my, my parents, my grandparents had these little uh, plastic boxes that had Monday, Wednesday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and you open it up and you, have, you take the little pills that are on the inside of that, right? Um, and, uh, and, and, and I was told I have to take this little kid's multivitamin thing as a supplement to all the other nourishment that I was having because that's what was going to actually fulfill all of those things within. That, that's what it says. Supplement your faith with the inner virtue that's being placed into your heart. Notice, you don't have to make this up. You don't have to go do things to make your heart have inner virtue. That actually comes as part of the package deal when you surrender your heart to the gospel power. We often talk about how then Jesus lives in our heart. Well, a fuller understanding is that actually the Holy Spirit is indwelling your heart at that moment. So that when we read a verse like Romans 5, verse 5, we begin to see what actually occurs. Let me just read it for you. It goes like this. God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. You think, wait a second, if my heart is changed and I'm supposed to love God with all I have, where do I get the love to love God with all that I have? Well, Romans 5.5 5 tells us that God pours His love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. When you have the Holy Spirit within you, you have inside of you all that you need to be able to love Him with what you have. You don't have to supply that. Praise God for that. An old Puritan preacher said it this way, the only way to dispossess the heart of old affection is by the expo expulsive power of a new one. Okay, that's some old theologian guy. What is he actually saying, right? In, in, English, in plain English, pastor, what, what, what's he saying? He says, if you have a heart before the gospel power, if you had a heart that was filled with all sorts of bad virtues, how do I get those bad virtues out of my heart? How do I stop being motivated to do sinful things? Well, you put your trust in the gospel, and then the Holy Spirit comes, and he pours these virtues into your heart. It's the expulsive power, expelling out the bad things when the Holy Spirit puts the virtue of love and all the other things that the Holy Spirit does. Remember, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, all that list from Galatians chapter 5, the fruit of the Spirit. And when that begins to happen, our lives truly begin to change. In all of this, uh, while we surrender our heart to the gospel, that's how we give our hearts to Jesus, we then submit to what he's placed inside of us. 
So many times we think we have to go create something good of our lives. I'm telling you, it's not creating something from the outside. It's allowing what the Holy Spirit has placed within you to get in tune with that, to actually do what the Holy Spirit has called you to. How does that happen? A heart of renewal. Do you see how all these things begin to go together, right? It's not like there's like we have to look at five separate things. We have to see how this pathway actually goes together to bring us to the spot where we love the Lord with all our heart. And so we begin to have a heart of renewal. Romans chapter 12 is somewhat familiar to us. If you turn there and look at verse 2, it says this, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. It's saying don't get into the mold that the world wants to shape you into. Rather, be transformed by the renewal of your mind to the things of Christ. Now, oftentimes when we hear that verse, we think that we're supposed to do something. What do you think we're supposed to do when you hear this verse? Shout it out. Be transformed by the... So it's like, ah, oh, I just got to think harder. I just got to think harder about God. Is that what that verse is saying? No. That's not what that verse is saying. Actually, the way the grammar is written, it's, it's a passive imperative. An imperative is a command, right? A passive imperative is not one that's telling you to do the action. The action has to come from outside of you. So how do I do something when I have to be passively doing it is the question, right? Look at verse 1, super helpful. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. When the gospel begins to change my heart, I surrender to him. When the heart of inner virtue begins to, begins to bubble out of me, I submit to and follow those virtues by sacrificing myself, by laying myself down and allowing God to change my mind about who He is and how He wants me to live. I was thinking about this. I, I, really, it comes down to the sacrificing self, comes down to really getting my eyes off of myself and getting my eyes onto Jesus. I remember when I was in high school, I saw a friend of mine do a backflip into the water, and I thought, that's awesome. I'd like to learn how to do that. And so I climbed up on one of those blob things at camp, you know, and, and I got up there and I turned around and, and I, I went to do a backflip and you know what I did? Backflop. <laughs> My back was red as red could be. Man, that thing was painful. I got up out of the water and I was like yelling at him, why didn't you tell me how to do it right? Because that wasn't how it was supposed to happen, right? And he was like, Nate, 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 you did it all wrong. You see, when you get up there and, and you begin to do the backflip, yes, you have to contort your body and throw itself in a way that might flop, but here's what changes flopping to flipping. When you get your eyes on the landing position, when you get your head around and put your eyes on the spot you want your feet to land, the rest of your body comes around. Listen, that's what Jesus is saying here. Get your eyes on him, see him, see Jesus. Get your eyes on him. As your heart begins to be full of gospel power and these new virtues come in, get your eyes on those virtues and how he gives it to you through that power and the rest of your body is going to begin to make a change. You're going to get your body to the spot it wants to go, which is also one of the things the epistles teaches us. In Colossians chapter 3, in Colossians 3, 9 and 10, it says this, It says, see that you put off the old self with its practices and put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge of the, of the image of its creator. When we get our eyes on Jesus, it begins to change us on the outside. And we begin to do the things we know Jesus wants us to do. That's how that change begins to occur. But notice here, there is still something that has to happen. We have to put off the old, it says in Colossians, and then put on something new. All right, so sermon is not about me, but can I just tell you something personal about myself? I hate picking what clothes I'm going to wear each day. I hate it. I hate it. You come in, my wife will tell you, I hate choosing what shirt I'm going to put on. If I had it my way, I would never take off the old, and I would always be in the old, and I wouldn't put on anything new because then I wouldn't have to decide what new thing to wear. OK? 
okay? I know it's weird, okay? I get that. But in all of this, what the gospel is saying is, listen, you can't just stay the way you are. If you think that it's okay that your life is just going just gonna to live life out in real comfortable fashion, I don't have to change anything about myself, that is not what God is saying. That's not how you can love him. He's actually called you to something different because he's given you this inner virtue that he wants to cause something different to begin to happen within you. So there is something that you do need to put on. It's these new virtues that he's called you to in this way. God wants your heart and you give it to him by purposing to put on the new things that he's created within your heart in this. What happens then is that you have a heart of a daily walk. Remember how I said at the beginning, God wants your heart? When, when, when he wants your heart, he wants the totality of you are, who you are because he's created you to be in relationship with him. Listen, this heart change isn't just something that happens once and then we never have to think about it ever again. It's a process of living life in an everyday type of way where we become more and more like him. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, there's a verse right at the end. Paul's actually doing some fabulous work in chapter 3, and then he says in verse 18, and we all with unveiled face beholding the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another, for this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. Okay, this verse is so cool, okay? It talks about, notice what it said at the beginning, we all with unveiled faces, It's actually referencing something that happened in the Old Testament when the Israelites had come out of the land of Egypt and they were, they had gotten across the Red Sea and then they went to Mount Sinai. And on Mount Sinai, Moses would go up the mountain and meet with God. And when he came down from meeting with God, the Israelites were like, Moses, Moses, stop it. We, your, your face is so glowing with the presence of God because you are with him. Please put something over it because we can't look at you. When it says we all with unveiled faces, it's referring to the fact of meeting with God and how that mirroring of his presence begins to change who we are because we're with him on a regular basis. And and as that change happens, it says we begin to be transformed from one degree of glory to another. Listen, the gospel power doesn't just save you at the beginning. Gospel power continues to make you more righteous as the heart of virtue begins to be filled and your mind is renewed by those things and then the outer change begins to happen and you're going to want more relationship with God as a result of it. Do you see how that allows you to love God with all your heart? I love this. Jesus gave us the command, love him with everything that you've got. And then he taught us how that's actually possible. Not in our own strength. We can't make that happen. But when we begin to follow the process of surrendering to gospel power and submitting to the virtue that's here and seeing Jesus for who he is, that allows us to purpose and set our lives to follow after him in his way so that we can have this daily relationship with him. God wants your heart, and he wants you to give all of it to him. Practically speaking, that relationship then is something that should be a priority. At the beginning of the year, many times there's a tendency to think, well, I'm going to change and I'm going to be different this year. And 2023 is probably no different, and we begin to make promises to ourselves that we're going to do some things differently. We're going to lose some weight and we're going to take a vacation and we're going to do various things. And it is January 15th and there is a good chance that many of those promises haven't even gotten off the ground. As you hear this message today, I don't want you to make a resolution. I don't want you to say, all right, I'm going to do something different. I want you to do what the path to doing Jesus' way begins to happen. I want you just to begin to ask God for gospel power in your life and to reveal the virtue that he's already placed in it, to see how he wants you to live and act, to set some things as priority and to walk daily with him. Not in a like, I check it off the list type of way, 
So many of us begin the new year and we're like, oh, new Bible reading plan. And we think that Bible reading plan is going to be the thing that causes us to love God with all our heart. I'm here to tell you that's great and it's good, but it's not everything. God wants a relationship with you, not just a checklist that you got your reading plan done. Now, God's character is found in His Word, and that's good, but can I also suggest that maybe you have not just a reading plan, but a singing plan and a silence plan and a stroll through the park plan where you allow God to begin to show you the greatness of His love for you and the totality of how He's loved you so that you, in turn, can love Him in all the ways that He's called you to do that very same thing. God wants your heart And I'm so glad that he didn't just command that we love him with all of our heart, but that he empowers us to love him with everything that we've got. By surrendering to gospel power and submitting to the inner virtue that the Holy Spirit places there, by seeing Jesus, getting our eyes on him as a sacrifice to him, by by getting uh, purposeful about outer change and ultimately walking in relationship with him. Folks, you'll never be more fulfilled then when you begin to to walk with God in the relationship he created you to have. He wants your heart. He wants all of you. And as we begin to see his way and see that it starts with our heart, would you just give it to him? Would you set it on him? Would you allow him to do the work of transformation through the power of the gospel? We can start right now. That's the good news. Why don't we start by praying, Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. I thank you so much that you not only give us a command for what it says, but you give us the power to how to do it. Lord, we're in awe that it's by faith, it's by belief, it's not by any work that we do that this gospel power begins to act in us by pouring the Holy Spirit and his virtues into us. Lord, even as you begin to do the work of transformation in us, Lord, we ask that you would help us to continue to see what you've done in the gospel so that we can begin to change in the ways that you want us to change on the outside. Lord, may it never be because we simply in our own effort and willpower seek to change. But Lord, help us to cling to your gospel and trust it for change. Lord, in that, would you just continue to create a love for you as we walk daily with you. Lord, help us to set our hearts in you in this way. It's in Christ's name I pray.